what what informs your your political perspective as you as you go about making laws and changing laws for Vermont? Okay, well, I start with, uh, in, interestingly, William F. Buckley's definition of conservatism. He said, "My conservatism is the rebuttable presumption that all else being equal, tradition deserves the benefit of the doubt." And I am a respecter of tradition. I am a respecter of our country's founding and defining principles. That's where I start an analysis. But you don't want to be hidebound. And I think Buckley himself saying, you know, all else being equal, the benefit of the doubt. You start with the idea, okay, this is the way we've been doing it. Why should we do it differently? Persuade me. And usually from that structure of an analysis, I come down on the progressive side on pretty much every issue. But I do not have an ideological predisposition towards uh, progressive politics. I, I tend to be a skeptic, but if someone can honor my skepticism and be persuasive, I'll go with it. So I, I I've, as I say, I usually end up uh, on the progressive side. I've run um, as a Democrat slash progressive um, someday. Not this year because we simply, we didn't get around to it. I hate to admit it. Neither I nor the progressives got together before the deadline. But I certainly in, enjoy progressive support. Um, I think the main issue for Americans always is freedom. And my conservative friends will tell you that their philosophy is less government, more freedom. Liberals believe in more government, less freedom. Actually, my for me, the question is never, do you want more freedom or less freedom? The question always is, whose freedom to do what to whom? And in every political debate, both sides say they're fighting for freedom. In the Civil War, the Confederacy was fighting for freedom read their literature, read their speeches. They were fighting for their rights to buy and sell human beings. You know, and, and um, right now with the, with the uh, abortion debate, uh, it is characterized as that, that the overturning of Roe v. Wade returned power to the states. Roe v. Wade was a federal power grab from the states. I would suggest that the anti-abortion laws are a state power grab from women. You know, so they're, they're again, you see, they're, they're, they're fighting for the freedom to take away other people's freedom. I've been getting a lot of angry emails lately about people who are fighting for their God-given constitutional right to breathe virus into other people's bodies against their wills. You know, this is fascism. You're taking away my body, my choice. And I say, yeah, and everyone else's body, everyone else's choice. If nothing else, if for God's sake, you got to wear a mask. If you don't want to vax, don't vax. And in fact, we've never had mandatory vaccination. And no one has ever seriously suggested it. They say, well, it's coerced because if you're not vaccinated, your kid can't go to school. And the answer is, well, right, <laughs> because you got to respect the rights of the other kids. So that kind of balancing act, and, and I, it really burns me when I hear people lecturing me about freedom because... Usually their freedom involves taking away someone's freedom, such as the freedom of the states to take away women's bodily autonomy. So that's what informs my, and, and then, then I guess finally the idea is um, there are things we do alone. If you earn your money, it's your money. It's yours to do with as you see fit. But some of it gets taxed. Now, the conservative view of taxes is that's your money and the state steals it for its liberal programs. Okay? I would suggest there are some things we do alone and some things we do collectively. And you have to do them collectively, not because Karl Marx said so. You have to do them collectively because it's the only way that works. And your taxes are your share of that collective expense. Now it may now you can argue over whether the taxes are set up fairly, 
whether the taxes are too high or not. But the idea that taxes, there is a slogan among conservatives that taxation is theft. And I would say, no, taxation is paying the bills. And if you don't want to be taxed, well, fine, let's, you figure out how to get around without a car. Without, well, you can have a car, you just can't have a highway. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so the fact that something is done socially does not make it socialist. And, uh, and I, I think that's part of the ongoing political rhetoric on pretty much every issue. It's amazing to me how much political discussion is not about actual bills or actual policies. It's about political philosophy. Yeah. In part because abstractions are more fun. Abstractions are more satisfying. I, in fact, I'm guilty of that from time to time. I'll, I'll move towards the abstract because it's more comfortable. But boy, I get that from the right wing all the time. Well, following up on that, the, the topic of personal freedom, uh, another controversial issue in Vermont has always been gun rights. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there will be some legislation this coming year. Uh, what do you foresee coming down the pipeline in terms of uh, gun control and uh, the, the argument that many will make, regardless of what is actually in the bill, that <laughs> this is just one more step on the slippery slope uh, to gun yeah. confiscation. Well, you know, the, this, and now we're going to get lofty and philosophical again. Sorry. <laughs> this is where I'm comfortable. Uh, the uh, slippery slope image is a very, very meaningful image. If you're at the top of a high hill, and you take one little step off the top, and it's a slippery slope, that one little step may seem inconsequential. You're still up high. You still got the view. You're only one step away from where you were. But in fact, you've put yourself in a position where you're never going back, and you're definitely going down because the slope is slippery. I would say that, for example, um, compromises on free speech are a slippery slope. People will say, well, I'm all for free speech, but that's too much. And I say, well, then what you're saying is you're all for free speech, but actually you're not. <laughs> okay. Um, with, um, with gun rights, it seems to me that the slippery slope is, is the wrong image. I would suggest it's a level path that has forks in it as you go down. In other words, if you require background searches, okay, then you've acknowledged the government's right to regulate firearms. Uh, you have rejected the notion that the government can't touch firearms at all, which the NRA would say. And that once you've left that, then there's nothing stopping you from later having the government outlaw firearms altogether. That's the logic that's being offered. But I say it's like a level path and it comes to a fork. You don't have to take that fork. Um, you have the option. And I think every gun regulation needs to be considered on its merits. Does it? Well, first question, does it comport to the Second Amendment? A lot of gun rights people will insist that they're defending the Second Amendment. And it's often they try to structure the argument that this is people who are for the Second Amendment, people who are against the Second Amendment. Usually in a discussion of guns, the gun rights person will say to me, you know, Senator, you took an oath to uphold the Constitution. You should uphold the Constitution. That's not being debated. Of course you're going to uphold the Constitution. The Second Amendment allows for regulation. These guys don't want to admit that, but it not only allows for it, it explicitly calls for it a well-regulated militia being essential to the preservation of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So we have the option of reasonable gun safety regulation. It is perfectly consistent with the Second Amendment. I don't need to be lectured about my oath of office. Uh, what are we li likely to be hearing? I think safe store is, is one uh, proposition that, that um, is mentioned. Um, Does that require someone to have their firearms locked at all times? Well, exactly what that would mean would be 
developed in, in the development of the bill. But the basic idea is that if, you, if you've owned firearms, you've got to keep them away from kids. And you've got to keep them away from despondent people in the family who might decide to do something bad to themselves. One, one of the great advocates for a safe store was a woman whose teenage son shot himself to death. Probably if he'd had 24 hours, if he'd had 20 minutes maybe to think about it, he would have changed his mind, you know? Uh, the, the trouble with, with um, suicide by, by gun is that it's total and instant, you know? There's no coming back. So I think we'll probably, I, I also hear, hear about getting a stricter on, on background checks. Um, and uh, there are a couple of organizations, uh, Gun Safe, and was it Every Community or Every Town? Every Town. Every Town. And um, they have a, a program. I'm, I'm not aware of, of anyone ha uh, having in introduced legislation at this point because this legislative session is over and we haven't elected the new legislature. Um, so we're in the point of, of draft requests where we get the bill started. So I don't know for a fact what anyone is, is involved with, but those are the kinds of uh, approaches I've heard about. Well, outside of the regulation of guns themselves, what more can Vermont be doing uh, with regard to mental health? We, it's clear that we need more, more resources and easier access for people. Yeah, well, first, I, I guess we will start with just say the not necessarily the biggest issue, but the most immediate and most pressing issue on, on mental health is uh, that we don't have the physical facilities necessary to cope with people in crisis. And I mean, there's, everyone has heard this. This is getting to be a cliche. But uh, the people who are having what used to be called a nervous breakdown, uh, uh, who are clearly in trouble spending days in the emergency room at the general local hospital because we don't have the places for them. And um, it's said that every family in America has some experience with mental health issues. I certainly, when I was a kid, there was a member of, of my family who was went through depressions that were just crippling. And that's not a matter. If you've never seen anyone going through a depression, we're not talking about feeling bad. We're <laughs> talking about really not able to function. And um, we get people who get into depression or anxiety, sometimes psychotic episodes, and we don't have a place to put them. So that's that's really the first order of business. Um, the another this is you were probably planning on asking this as a separate question, but uh, the big mental health issue we have right now is addiction. And that is a mental health issue. It's compulsive behavior. There are certainly physical, obviously physical uh, dimensions to addiction, but it's also just the um, the issue of, of compulsive, destructive behavior. Um, it took me 10, maybe 11 separate tries to give up cigarettes. I fought my weight all my life, often been on the losing side of that one. So I, I personally know what compulsive self-destructive behavior is like. And I think other people do as well. They might not recognize that in themselves. Someone who's 40 pounds overweight saying, well, why don't these drug users just say no? You know, why don't you say no to ice cream? Let's start with that. <laughs> um, so we, what to do about that? This is a hell of a thing to say when you're running for public office, but I don't know. <laughs> right. Honest answer. It is. It is. Um, people have been. People have been getting high since the cavemen, apparently. Um, but I, you know, certainly when someone is addicted, they're not. They're not taking the drugs anymore to get high. They're taking drugs to not be intolerably sick. And uh, but we do know that some people are able to overcome addiction. I have a, a buddy who has not had a drink in 40 years now. I once referred to him as an ex-alcoholic, and he corrected me. He said, I'm not an ex-alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic. 
And I said, yeah, but you're an alcoholic who hasn't had a drink for 40 years. And he said, no, I'm an alcoholic who is not drinking today. And I would say about cigarettes, same thing with me, is that I, not a day goes by. I don't want to be great to have a cigarette right now, but, you know, one day at a time. I didn't give you a very good answer because I don't have a very good answer well, on that. Is is some of the incoming settlement money with the opioid manufacturers, you know, can that make a dent in it? What can that do? Well, there are things we can do. For one thing, the... the um, the science of addiction, there's a, there's a guy, Dr. Lord, down here in, in, uh, in Windsor. Jill Lord is a leader, I mean, a real hero of, of dealing with prevention. And then Fred Lord deals with recovery. He's a doctor. And, and he has talked about the science of, of brain receptors that actually uh, certain drugs, it's not just that they make you feel good and you get used to it and you want to recover the high, but rather that they diminish some of the, the pleasure receptors and, and cause a, a, a really desperate state. And that there are chemical, medicinal ways to help people get through that. Now, they still have to, people often backslide, but um, there are treatments that do work sometimes for some people. I think the public gets discouraged. I hear it from people often saying, they're not going to recover. There's no such thing as recovery. Well, for some people, there isn't. For some people, there is. And I think we got to support that. And, um, and that means there, there's medical help in dealing with withdrawal. And then you, you also get in, into the, the psychotherapy of compulsive behavior. And uh, as again, as a, I'm not going to say ex cigarette as a confirmed cigarette addict who hasn't had a smoke in many years, uh, I understand how hard that is. Well, it seems like one of the things that can help solve any problem is money. If we have the money and we have good policy, we're better equipped to deal with problems like these. In the past couple of years, there's been an infusion of federal dollars. Yeah, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Do you worry that? It, there's any chance that we create new services and programs with this money, and then when it dries up, people are going to be left hanging? Or, did, or have we... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, occasionally, uh, young people, kids will, you know, young teenagers, 13, 14 year old, will say, what do you actually do as a state senator? And I say somewhat glibly, I'll say, oh, I spend other people's money. And I intend that as a statement of personal humility, that I'm aware that it's not my money. I'm respectful of the other people whose money it is. Uh, I stopped saying it because I realized that people thought I was sort of bragging. <laughs> you know, that, that, that like their view is, you're damn right you do, you know, but... Um, the point is, if you're spending other people's money, you have an obligation to them to, um, to be careful. And it's tempting to be generous with other people's money. That's part of the conservative critique of liberals, is that we're too generous with other people's money. And often someone will thank me for voting for an appropriation. And I'll say, well, you know, don't thank me, thank the taxpayers. And the result is, and this gets to another issue, which is about how, uh, that nothing is simple and you really do have to work with people you disagree with, is that part of the conservative critique of progressive politics is that we spend too much money. And I think it is not an adequate answer to get teary-eyed about the needs I know there are needs. That's why I'm there. That's my focus, is how do you address the needs? But addressing the needs costs money, other people's money. So you always have to balance whatever you're trying to do. You have to balance it against the, um, the reluctance of the taxpayers to see yet more of their hard-earned money. Going, I defended taxes a few minutes ago. It, it's your share of the common, the common need. But uh, 
the, there's always a legitimate question, well, what is my fair need, my fair share? And uh, is that really a, a need? Could we do with less? And I mean, that's, that's the discussion that goes on all the time is, um, do we really need to do this? And do we need to do this much? And, um, are we spending more than we, than we need to? Mm -hmm. Including th times, and I hear this from my Republican friends all the time. Uh, this is a great idea. I'd love to do it, but <laughs> and that's a legitimate objection. How do you see the creeping inflation and the rising cost of goods factoring into state politics in the in the next year? Well, first of all, the public, any anyone I talk to, any citizen I talk to, and when I'm out handing out my pamphlet, hi, I'm Dick McCormick, I'm running for Senate, the question invariably is, what are you going to do about the economy? And um, the an honest answer is, I'm not the Federal Reserve, and the economy is operate is run by market forces. We don't have a, a managed economy. They had a managed economy in the Soviet Union. It didn't work out so well. You know, we have a free enterprise system. Uh, and market forces are not always our friends. So it's don't trust any politician who runs on the issue of a bad economy. Because it by definition it's that's demagoguery. Okay, elect me and I'll straighten this mess out. Nonsense, the hell you will. Uh, the analogy, of course, people used to talk about the ship of state. And our ship of state, and every ship of state on the planet, <laughs> is in going through very, very rough waters. We're in the middle of a hurricane. So part of what you do about a bad economy is you at least make sure no one freezes to death. You make sure no one starves. You take care of the most desperately poor. And that is not liberalism. That's civilization. That's just decency. And, you know, you read, read the Old Testament, you know, and what has it say? The stranger within your gates, you know, the people and the stranger within your gates. You take care of at least the basic. Uh, and, and we do that, and, it, and it's lousy, people being put up in, in motels and that kind of thing. No one thinks that's a, a good thing. Better that than that they be out in the cold. Uh, so too with um, you know some kind of income, and someone will say, "Well, I work for a living. Why should my taxes support these people?" And, yeah, I understand your resentment. I resent it too, maybe. Nevertheless, <laughs> now that we've settled that, you're not gonna gonna let people starve. Uh, the next step up is how do you improve the economy? What can we do? I don't think the Vermont government is in a position to take care of a global recession. We are not in a position to take care of, of global inflation. That's a hell of a platform to run on, but there it is. Uh, but we can, and this goes back, I've been doing, doing this analysis for over 30 years in the Senate. We have certain strengths, one of which is our beautiful environment and that the human footprint on this environment is beautiful. In many ways, the Adirondacks are more beautiful, a more beautiful environment than the Green Mountains. But the human footprint is a little bit depressing. <laughs> you know, we have these beautiful villages and the farms. We have an environment, and it sells the product. You put the words Vermont on the label, and sales go up. I'm using a very old study. Maybe it's been updated. But my understanding is that about 15% that a product sales will go up just because it's from Vermont. Um, and we have, we've had Vermont, Vermont maple syrup, syrup and Vermont, Vermont cheese for many years. We can't compete as a, our business, our, our dairy farms, farms can't compete with agribiz for just cold milk. But our cheese can compete, and uh, and our ice cream obviously is a success story. That's an old story by this time. But um, when I first started, that was about it, and everything else was a theory. And now we've got the beer, 
We've got the, the whiskey and the gin, and, and uh, we've also got tourism. Uh, I think that will, it is helping our, our economy, and we want to take care of the Vermont mystique. Uh, modern communications, telecommunications, make Vermont more suitable for I call it white collar work, brainy work. <laughs> the, the stuff. There are guys in out the outskirts of Boston, or folks out in Silicon Valley who would love to live in Vermont, and generally couldn't because you know, well, how am I going to make a living there? And now you can make a living here. You can work from home if you if you have connectivity, and uh, telecommunications connectivity is is important. That will then raise a problem, which is a lot of the economic disincentives to sprawl are now no longer there. You can probably build a log cabin on the top of a mountain, you know, and, and blast in a half mile driveway and so on, um, and and work very happily from home. So we're we're going to have to resist the temptation to get sloppy about the our environmental regulation. And that temptation is there. I hear that all the time from my colleagues, mm -hmm. including liberal, progressive, green colleagues who damn well ought to know better. And that is, you know, well, we, we got to lighten up on Act 250. That'll, that'll help the economy. Well, at what cost? Yeah. Uh, I don't know about Bethel, but I know in Barnard, where I live, uh, with the pandemic, we've seen an influx of new residents, yeah. both full-time and part-time, a lot of new construction, uh, some professionals, some folks who just want a second home to get away from the city to. Uh, I wonder how that, in the long term, because I don't think it's, it's finished yet, but how that will could change the face of rural Vermont. Well, it certainly will change the face of the politics of the whole state. Because it, it just creates, I, I, believe it or not, politicians don't go looking for troubles. <laughs> you know, I would much rather just be a jovial old state senator and everything be easy. The problems find us. And um, we're going to have, in fact, I would say the government has no business dealing with anything except things that in which there is no profit, but they are necessary, like health care. Okay, and uh, uh, so too with um, the the politics of rural Vermont, the economics of rural Vermont, is that that's going to change whether government wants to change. Well, government doesn't have to change it. It's changing because of market forces, and we have to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I do see one res one response that I have been resisting, and that is well, we're going to have to back off on our environmental protections. Rarely described in those words. Yeah. <laughs> Got to streamline the process. And it means back off. Is there any, any merit to that? To, or, or is this, this argument that Act 250 is just so onerous, is that sort of a, a little yeah, exaggerated? I, I think it's exaggerated. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, first of all, most of the Act 250 horror stories I hear are, um, you know, it took me three years, $100,000 to get my Act 250 permit. Well, you find out that it actually took you two and a half years to lose your battle against jurisdiction, which was doomed to begin with. This happens often. There's this idea that Act 250 is so onerous that you want to avoid jurisdiction altogether. And people fight tooth and nail to avoid jurisdiction. And they lose because, in fact, they are under the law subject. And then it takes, you know, a few months to get the permit. Uh, also, when people will talk about what they spent to get their permit, often that includes what they spent on the actual physical plant that was necessary to qualify for the permit, which they now own. You know, the septic system or, or, or whatever that was the, the, the questionable or the problematic uh, part of the permit. And... Um, also, just in terms of raw numbers, this is what it costs. The question is, what, what percentage was that of the total cost of the, of the project? People would talk about really, really big projects. 
uh, people will cite, uh, going back many years now, various Act 250 permits for Killington that, that took a long time and cost a lot of money. But first of all, thank God for Killington. I, I, I derived a lot of income from the tourist trade. Uh, it's nothing against Killington to say, it's on a mountain. <laughs> it's headwaters. It's ledge. It doesn't perk. There's, you know, it, it causes a lot of traffic. There are serious questions that you ought to be asking and getting answers for. Mm -hmm. No one, you didn't have to be against skiing to say, well, yeah, I'm in fact, they got, they get the permit in the end. But yeah, we got to make sure you're doing it right. Yeah. So climate change is on the minds of a lot of people right now with, with what we're seeing all over the world with droughts and fires and record-breaking temperatures. I don't let myself be scared because if you really want to look into the abyss and we're right on the edge, in fact, kind of we're already past the point of no return, um, I would be so scared as to, as, as to be paralyzed. Uh, in a crisis, it's interesting, I did not know you were going to ask the question that way. How scared am I? One of the things you have to do in a crisis is just not allow your fear to overcome you. And I remember many, many years ago, uh, just focusing on the possibility of nuclear war. The Soviet Union was still there. We're having this nuclear arms race and being terrified of nuclear war. And I got involved in the nuclear freeze movement, which failed. But it got me straightened out psychologically. If you got a problem, do something about it, damn it, you know. So uh, I try not to dwell on the fear. But we are at the point of no return in that um, global warming is already worsening forest fires. This is just one example. Global warming, warming is worsening forest fires. Forest fires put carbon into the atmosphere, which causes global warming. So now you got a vicious cycle. And global warming causes global warming in that instance. The other one is the melting of Arctic and Antarctic ice. Ice is white. It reflects sunlight back into space. When, when it melts, you have seawater, which is dark and which absorbs light and energy. So now you are, so melting ice causes more ice to melt and the sea level to rise. Uh, in my lifetime, I have seen the discussion years ago, no one talked about mitigation, about what are we going to do to live with global warming? The question was, what are we going to do to stop anthropogenic global warming? Uh, no more. We are now talking about, okay, it's coming. What are we going to do to live with it? But that also means if we can't stop it, what are we going to do to change our behavior so that we don't make it worse? And that leads, in terms of Vermont politics, we passed a clean energy bill in the last session. I serve on the Natural Resources and Energy Committee, and I can tell you I was that far from voting against that bill because it was such a disappointment. It was such a mediocrity. And I have people, to this day, there are people who are angry at me for supporting the bill because they just said it, it just doesn't go anywhere. It allows for, for uh, um, fossil fuels, or not fossil fuels, but for, for uh, biofuels, which introduce carbon. And, you know, they're not green. Uh, plus, it takes away what you got to cut the trees down, which means you've lost a carbon sink. Um, there are all sorts of things. That counted. We counted uh, Hydro-Quebec as, uh, as green power. Well, I voted for that back in the 90s because it was the only way to get the bill through, and at, at that time, an energy bill. And so, too, I finally voted for this bill, figuring it was the best we were going to get. And uh, it's easier to be morally huffy, well, you should have opposed it, Senator. I would have felt better if I had. I would have slept better. But um, I often sacrifice 
my ability to sleep, to get things done. I always say, uh, my first presidential election, I refused to vote for Hubert Humphrey because he wasn't strong enough against the war in Vietnam. I voted for Benjamin Spock. I slept like a baby and helped elect Richard Nixon. And I thought, okay, my moral and intellectual purity is at the price of good government. And so I, ever since, I have always resisted uh, going along to get things done. But in the end, I am not up there to be a saint. I'm up there to get legislation passed. If not good legislation, then as good as possible. So I voted for the damn bill. And our governor vetoed it. <laughs> Which is amazing. It was apparently too much in his view. And uh, I, I count Phil Scott as a personal friend. I was his first committee chair. We've always had a mutual admiration society. We still do. I admire and respect my friend Phil Scott. But on this issue, boy, was he wrong. Just so wrong. And, and uh, I think what we got to do is, is, is go back and hopefully pass something better than what we did last year, but it, certainly not back down. Um, it is global warming is the overarching existential issue of our time. And um, I can tell you that 40 years ago, those of us who were concerned about global warming at the time, environmental wackos was Rush Limbaugh's term for us, uh, we spoke of global warming in the future tense. Terrible things that are going to happen. We're here. You know, you got, you've got the forest fires, you've got the hurricanes. Of course, then people say, well, global warming doesn't cause hurricanes. We've always had hurricanes. Yeah, not as many and not as bad. And, um, well, it was cold three weeks ago. So much for your global warming nonsense. It's, you know, look at the graph. Yes, the temperature goes up and down. It does. That's right. Up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> Eventually, the, the, the overall trend is hot, hotter and hotter. So, electric cars. Electric cars are cheaper than gas cars. If you look at the total expense of purchase and running it, people say, yeah, electric cars are for rich people. You're not, you're not worried about us poor people. Actually, electric cars will save you money, but they're very expensive to get into. Mm -hmm. So that can be addressed. We need low interest or no interest loans, and you pay the loan off out of the savings from not buying all that expensive gas. It's not rocket science. Um, we need, well, you can't have electric cars because there aren't enough sta uh, charging stations. Well, I'll go back to the 19 teens. And, well, I'm not going to buy a car, there aren't enough gas stations. Well, I'm not going to open a gas station. There aren't enough cars. <laughs> Gradually, you ratchet it up. And, and here is where government can do something, which is basically this is all based on market forces. Government doesn't make cars. Private companies, corporations make cars. And government doesn't sell electricity as a rule. You know, but we can tweak that a little bit, starting by making sure there are charging stations at park and rides and getting it out that that's one of the things in the clean energy bill was just making sure that the, that you can you can use your your electric car you can actually use it you don't have to just own it but if we if we've already reached the tipping point if some of these feedback loops are already out of control uh, it seems like no no amount of electric cars will save us uh, so what are, what are some things we could do to adapt, assuming that once this, once all these cycles play out, there are still parts of the globe that are habitable. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, electric cars may not stop global warming, but let's at least stop making it worse. To use a, a cliche that is so overworked that I'm reluctant, but you know, when you're in the bottom of a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. Um, there it is. I mean that. Let's stop making it worse. In particular, where, where this, this is something we can do. I mean, the technology is there. 
and uh, it's it's a, it really is a matter of political will. Uh, but what can we do for for adaptation? One thing is is uh, in term being more selective in where we build. And uh, the current uh, development patterns in Vermont clearly reflect early on the use of water power. And we have our villages at waterfalls often. Also, our transit follows stream valleys, river valleys, and then you get up, you follow, the, even getting up into the highlands, you tend to follow a brook. The road follows a brook. I live on the Cleveland Brook Road. My grandfather grew up on the Stoddard Brook Road. My ex-wife lives on the Camp Brook Road. So what we probably want to do is make sure that we've pulled back if we're, any new building should not be that vulnerable, because we have a terrible vulnerability that way. Um, the existing villages, they're there. Um, and that might, maybe even though we don't want to rip rap because it channels the water power further downstream, I supported rip wrapping part of Bethel because we were going to lose the village otherwise. Um, but we should not allow, or we should at least be reluctant. I don't want to be too, because I'm talking about scenes where I have not seen the plans, but in general, prox likelihood of getting flooded implies that this might not be a good place to build. Let's put it that way. That's being as mild as I can be. That that our our tendency should be to avoid uh, risking flooding. Um, I think we can. Uh, but uh, again, the reason I'm hesitating, the reason I'm, I'm floundering for an answer, is because I really think it's too soon to just focus on on mitigation. I mm -hmm. think we are actively making the problem worse, and that's really the first order of business. Mm -hmm. is back off on carbon. So the American tradition, uh, to wrap up, has been, at least in recent memory, Republicans versus Democrats. And it seems to be devolving into not so much a civil debate about ideas and policies, but about winning and losing. And it, it seems to be getting more tribal, more vicious. Uh, do you think that this, this two-party system is is just the, the inevitable way forward, or can American politics evolve into something that maybe yeah. works a little better? I will answer that question. I do want to say something, though, if we're wrapping up, which is we did not talk about racism and discrimination against uh, sexual nonconformers and so on. Uh, well, that feeds into I, this partisan okay. divide that we're talking about. Well, so. I, I would hate to think that equity and inclusion our last year's hot issue and have gone out of fashion. And I have a, a feeling that that's sort of happening around me. I find much less focus on that, more focus than ever on public radio, but in terms of just the public, what I'm hearing from. And I think those are issues are real and we cannot spend a year crying crocodile tears and then just forget that they exist. We've got to stay focused on that. Okay, uh, the parties, the two party system. I have worked with my Republican colleagues and worked well for over 30 years. I mentioned I was Phil Scott's first committee chair. Um, most bills out of my committee had Phil Scott's vote. It was Democratic chair, Democratic majority on the committee. I had Phil Scott's vote. I didn't get it for free. He negotiated from a Republican point of view. He also recognized that he wasn't in the majority. But I, we made adjustments in bills to get Republican support. Uh, Joe Benning, who uh, I will not be voting for because I prefer David Zuckerman, but Joe Benning, for whom I have personal respect, um, showed me a note I wrote him 10 years ago in the middle of a debate where I said, I hate it when a Republican is right. We have to work together, and we can work together, and we do work together. The problem with Trumpism is that they're not real Republicans. 
They call the real Republicans rhinos, Republican in name only. Actually, the so-called rhinos, they're the real Republicans. They're in the tradition of Dean Davis and George Aiken, or going all the way back to Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, I would say that Republicans and I have been arguing over whether that pitch was a ball or a strike. The argument with the Trumpists is whether or not three strikes make an out. The Republicans I've mentioned, and other Republicans as well, by I just mentioned two Republicans, neither of whom I'm going to vote for. <laughs> and it's not just supporting the nominee of the party. We have philosophical differences. But those Republicans, whatever our disagreements, we agree on the ground rules for how you handle the disagreement. And our disagreement with the Trumpists is more fundamental than that. Uh, we disagree about whether or not it's okay to just make facts up. And that everyone has an equal right to an opinion. Everyone has an equal right to express their opinion. Everyone has an equal right to have their opinion considered. That doesn't mean all opinions are equal. Some opinions have been examined and disproven, such as the 2020 election was stolen. No, it wasn't. You know, and the idea that, well, maybe it wasn't, but we say it was. And so we deserve equal time. And, and you know, the, the news is biased. They call it, a, they say, they use the word lie to describe, well, it's, yeah, it's a lie. <laughs> you know, we have to, we do have to unite against Trumpism. Because Trumpism is more fundamental than the differences between Republicans and Democrats. Let's say fair capitalism says market forces are benign, keep the government out of it. Communism says market forces are malignant, the government should run the economy. We Americans, liberals and conservatives alike, have a shared consensus on the idea that we want reasonable government regulation of market forces. We all agree on that. We disagree on what exactly is reasonable. Well, that's a legitimate disagreement. And, and there are times when I, as a Democrat, as a liberal, as a progressive, will, will hear from a, an objection from a, a more conservative colleague, and I'll think, I don't entirely agree with him. But I could live, I could live with a compromise with them. He has a point. It's not, that's what intelligent, reasonable people do. That's the ethical thing. And I, I can tell you, in Vermont, we have traditionally worked together. People can't, can't believe that with a Democratic majority in each house, we have Republican committee chairs. They can't believe that. Well, we don't have a lot. And they don't, and they don't share appropriations. Okay, you know, but um, uh, yeah, because it's because they got elected too. When I was a Democratic chair of a committee that had Republican members, I said to the committee, I said, the Republican members of this committee got got elected the same as I did. Their claim on a right to govern is exactly the same as my claim. They they they, they derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. And their constituents have as much of a right to be considered as mine do. And that doesn't mean any Republican had a blank check. It meant you work together. And it's, at times, they might even be right. But even if they're not entirely right, you know, can you live with this? It's their state, too. So I, I, I believe that Vermont is a model for how to do that. I, I, hear, I do hear from Trumpists. My emails have some hate in them, then they have a little bit of hysteria. And in particular, what's frustrating for me is the inapt invocation of the Constitution and the inapt invocation of, of freedom. That I'm sorry, Mr. Trumpist, but I'm not against freedom. I know it's easier for you to think I am, but I'm not. And I'm not going to say I'm as much for freedom as you are. I'm saying I'm much more. I'm a champion. I'm a real champion of freedom. And I'm a real champion of the Constitution. So looking back on your time in the legislature, in the Senate, uh, what are some things you could point to as things that you're, you're proud of, 
uh, that you you felt like you served your constituents well by doing, and what are some things you still want to accomplish before your time is done, assuming you get reelected yeah. in November? I think the answers probably overlap somewhat. Uh, I have been, I think, one of the loudest and most consistent defenders of environmental protection. Uh, it's one of the reasons I got involved in, in politics. Um, I, at one time, chaired the Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Uh, I serve on that committee now. Uh, and I can tell you that in all my years in the Senate, there was never a year that Act 250 has not been under attack. And people will often say things like, well, Act 250 is all well and good, but you have to compromise. And my answer is Act 250 is a compromise. In the 1960s, Vermont experienced uh, unprecedented development. Uh, the effects of the, uh, the post-World War II GI Bill uh, and post-World War II economic development the building of the interstate and the development of the ski industry. And there were two schools of thought about development because it seemed to be having a negative impact on the economy, on the um, environment. One school of thought was bring it on. We hate to see it go. We loved Vermont the way it was, but come on, can't stop progress. That's often said as a cheery little song. Well, you can't stop progress. We're, we're going to ruin, going to destroy that village. Well, you can't stop private like that's a good thing. Yeah? Uh, and they said, no, we want the jobs. We want the influx of capital. We want the tax revenues. Bring it on. Then there were others, the real conservatives, usually Republicans, interestingly, who would say, well, I think Vermont's pretty good just the way it is. We don't need all this outside. This is not Vermont. That's Connecticut. That's not Vermont. Dean Davis, Art Gibb, these Republicans came up with a compromise. They said, we do want the capital. We do want the, um, the jobs. We do want the tax revenues. Yes, bring it on. Develop Vermont. But do it right. Do it, but do it right. The debate had been, do it, don't do it. And they said, do it, but do it right. And that was Act 250. Then there were concerns about, well, you, do you really want a lot of state bureaucrats making all these decisions? And the answer was, no, we'll have these local district commissions. The state bureaucrats are the experts, and they'll provide testimony, but the real decisions will be up to the community. Uh, and I think Act 250 has worked well. If it has failures, it's, if you drive around, you look at, at what Act 250 didn't manage to stop. And of course, the reason is because it's not supposed to stop development. It's supposed to di direct it and, and structure it so it's environmentally uh, responsible. And it's not all regulatory because over time, developers will say to their engineers, um, give me a design that'll get, that'll get an Act 250 permit. So the engineers know what tends to, to be permitted and what, what is not. And uh, the result is that we've had, if you look at the years since Act 250 passed, it's unprecedented development. All sorts of development has happened under Act 250. But we still have most of our beautiful villages. We still have a green countryside. I don't know how long that'll, that'll be. That's a, an issue still before us. Um, but in any case, I would say, what, I'm, what am I proudest of? Uh, my, my defense of Act 250. I've always been a civil libertarian, um, and which is to say uh, fighting for, for um, uh, personal freedom, which is not always controversial in Vermont. It has not been much of a fight. But every now and then something has come up. You know, there, there have been some First Amendment issues that have come up over the years. And um, I've stood firm. For the, uh, for the First Amendment. Uh, the argument always along the lines of, well, I'm all for free speech, but. 
that kind of are. And I, I said, well, no, there's no but for me. I'm for free speech. Um, I have generally voted with my caucus. I mentioned earlier the idea that uh, I don't want to be in the position where my intellectual clarity and moral virtue gets in the way of my being effective. I vote with my caucus as a rule. And I mention that first because I want to point out that I, I don't try to be a saint or a martyr, but I have been the sole dissenting vote on a number of issues over the years. And I'm proud that I, I do not crave martyrdom. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's not like I find it dramatic to go down fighting. But um, I, um, I have had the backbone to stand alone. And I'm proud of that. I also think that I have from time to time, I haven't done it often, that when I have stood alone, subsequent events have proven I was right. Um, I voted against, um, what was it called, Challenges for Change, which was just a, a, a smile, putting a smiley face on a program to cut government services. But it was sound like, we want bureaucrats to feel that they're invested. It, it struck me as nonsense. I said at the time, I said, it, it strikes me as, it reminds me of a faculty meeting. <laughs> the, the kind of jargon you hear at a faculty meeting. And, um, and sure enough, uh, the, I remember my son calling me, he was about 25 at the time, he said, I just heard on the news you were the sole dissenting vote on something. I don't know what it was, but I'm proud of you for being the sole dissenting vote. <laughs> uh, but it, as it turns out, I mean, I think I was vindicated. Uh, uh, so I voted against uh, utility restructuring back in the 90s uh, because, again, I thought we just hadn't researched it enough. And uh, I was the only, not the sole dissenting vote on the bill, but uh, the other people who voted against it had completely other reasons. I was the only one who said, this has not been researched enough. And uh, as it turns out, the Senate passed the bill. The House did not because Speaker Obahoski agreed with me and blocked it. And years later, all over the country, states that had done restructuring like what was proposed in Vermont had these disastrous <laughs> results <laughs> to the point where Vermont was like, I, I went to an energy conference and I was treated like a rock star. How did you know? How did you know? And my answer was, well, we didn't. We just knew that we didn't know. A little tilt of the hat to Donald Rumsfeld on that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so uh, I guess those are the two things I'm proud of. What do, what do I still want to take care of? Goddamn global warming. We're not done on global warming. And I expect I'm going to be defending Act 250 again. Why should this year be any different? Um, but uh, people often say, you know, what are your favorite issues? What are your most important issues? And my answer is, that's like asking me what's more important to me, my heart or my brain. I mean, I'm going to die if, he, if I lose either of them. So there are a lot of issues. But I, I probably global warming is the big one. Okay. Well, how can voters learn more about you, get in touch with you? Do you have a website? I'm an old man, and I don't have a website. I do have a Facebook page. Okay. Which is the cliché. Facebook, Facebook is where old people go on the internet. Uh, yeah, uh, Senator Dick McCormick on Facebook, and I think he also, if you put in McCormick for Senate, it'll get there. Those those words, McCormick and Senate. And you're out on the campaign trail, going to events. Yes, constantly. People. I'll be out later today. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I am running as a team with uh, Becca White and Allison Clarkson. I have great respect for both of them, and we're a good balance. I was Becca White's teacher once. I was in the Senate when she was born. You want some youth? You got it. The other thing is Becca White is smart as a whip and full of energy. Thank you, Senator McCormick, for your time this morning. Uh, thank you for your service, and good yeah. luck out on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, folks. <laughs>